we come from different perspectives. Um, and so I think that sometimes it's really hard to, to find that middle ground, to find those things that, there are a lot of comments here. <laughs> okay. Wow. Um, but I, I think that for me it was refreshing to hear um, a district attorney who wanted to talk about justice, who wanted to talk about what that really means to this community. And um, I think that that, for me, I felt like that was something that was, was missing uh, previously. And so the way that you uh, spoke about it was, I think, with an open, uh, an open heart and wanting to, to, to hear what those different perspectives were. And so um, for you to do that, um, I, I just admire that a lot in you. Um, and I can see that that's how you've chosen to lead. And uh, that's really incredibly important. Um, I think that there were voices that felt that they weren't being heard fully. <coughs> and so um, you, you've, you've done that. You've come in and really listened to the community, and um, I don't know, I, I'm, I, I'm very proud of that. So I hope you noticed how skillfully she turned that whole question around and didn't answer about her, right? She just turned it all around, that wasn't it. But, but thank you for that, and um, I'm gonna let her, she's gonna be looking through the cards and, and she will, uh, read them, um, and then whichever one you want to start with, Cole. Yeah. Um, <laughs> it's almost like she's dealing cards here, right? <laughs> <laughs> All right. Um, so these are some of these are hard questions, I think. So are all of prepare for that. Are all the questions going to be read? Not all of them because we just don't have all the time. Right? Yeah, no, she will. She will pick. Um, not one of the things she's doing is she's just laying them out. So. If it's a listening okay. session, though, you spent 15 minutes telling us on what we're doing. It was supposed to be a listening session. You listen and you talk. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, well, first, I wanted to be able to give you some information for context. And I did say at the beginning I would be sharing that information, and then the second part would be, you know, hearing from you guys. Um, I think that was the most fair way to do it, so that you can get some information about the office, things that you may not have known before. It was promoted by the library as a listening session. That's why people are here to listen, uh, to speak rather than to listen. Mm -hmm. Okay. I've got a question. Okay. And there are a lot, so we're going to try and get through as many as we can. You mentioned equitable justice, reducing inequity, and restorative justice. What do those terms mean to you? Also, restorative justice has been an abysmal failure in larger metropolitan areas like Seattle, LA, and Chicago. Why do you think this will work in part of slash of County? So the first, oh, sorry. I'm just going to hold this. Equitable justice, reducing inequity, and restorative justice. Equitable justice and reducing inequity. I've been always very vocal from the very beginning that I believe that there are some disparities in this system. Disparities based on race, disparity based on socioeconomic. <coughs> and so being able to make sure that we are conscious of the decisions that we're making. You know, as prosecutors, we have the authority of who we charge, what crimes we charge people with, the recommended sentencing that we may give. Now, at the end of the day, it is always the judge who makes the decision on those sentences. And there have been plenty of times where not just myself, but other prosecutors, <coughs> other DA offices may have presented a plea to a judge who has, I don't know if this keeps coming up now, who has actually rejected the pleas that have been worked out between the defense and the state um, and not accepted them, right? And so that happens because it is the judge who makes that ultimate decision, not the DA, not a defense attorney. It is the judge. That is their role there. And so for me, reducing inequity, 
uh, equitable justice means that we do recognize that there is this issue in this system and that you know we have to acknowledge it so that we can eliminate it as much as, as possible. So things like implicit bias would be something that we train our prosecutors on um, so that they can understand their own biases that they have within them. In terms of restorative justice, to me, that is a process where the two people who are most affected by what happened have an opportunity to communicate and have a conversation together and find a solution and a way forward. One of the things that we hear often is that the current system, the way it's set up adversarial in that way, does not always give a victim the opportunity to ask the biggest question that they have. And that question is, why me? Why did you do this to me? And they never get to ask that question, nor do they ever get the answer. And restorative justice is a process that allows that to happen. Now, does that mean that it, it works for every single case? No, right, no. First of all, it's a voluntary process, and both parties have to want to be part of that circle and part of that conversation because it can't just be one side and not the other. It doesn't work that way, right? Why do I believe that it can work here? Because it has worked in other places. Has it worked everywhere? No. Has anything ever worked everywhere 100% of the time? No. But part of it is learning what didn't work in other areas and then adopting it and learning from those lessons as to what can make it work here. I also think that we have different partners now in doing this work. And because the school system has started with some of this restorative practices already in the school system, it's not that large of a leap to then put it into the juvenile system because a lot of these kids have, have heard of it. Have where, seen where has it worked? Seen it. Where has it worked? In different cases, Where? in San Diego, it has worked. Okay, it did you, it did you not work in San Diego. <laughs> well, I can give you, anywhere. I can give you many different that. records of where it has worked, as well as there are many different places where it hasn't. But just because it hasn't worked everywhere, does not mean that it does not work in some places and has great benefits. And so we can agree to disagree on that issue, but I do believe that this is definitely a strategy that is very beneficial to our community when done right, when done intentionally, when given the commitment of the type of resources that it needs so that we can move forward. Okay. Next question. There is a serious shortfall, shortage of trial assistant district attorneys. Your office is budgeted for 17 and Sorry, the handwriting is difficult. Uh, as far as three trial experience attorneys are still employed, how many have you lost uh, since the beginning of your term? Okay, well, we don't have just three. We actually have five um, attorneys. We have three more in um, the process. It takes a very long time to hire people through the HR process here. Um, we also have two ABA apprentices. They have taken their bar exam in February, so we'll know about the results in a few months. And we have four new apprentices that will be joining us in August, okay? And so what we've done is we've developed a new pipeline of how we can bring in people um, to be ABAs into this office. Um, yeah, so there are two I guess cycles that happened in my office in terms of hiring. When I first came in, the people who were there were told that I was going to fire everybody. Um, and when I came in, I told them, you know, I will give you the benefit of the doubt. You give me the benefit of the doubt. Let's see what happens. Um, I told them who I was, what I expected from them. Some people decided that was not what they wanted. Okay, and so they left. Uh, at that point, I had only fired one person and it was not an ABA, right? Everybody was given their time to find another opportunity for them and we brought in new people. This time what happened was we had a series of surrounding circuits who increased their salaries in Clayton County. Just the, um, the public defender's office went up to 105,000 for a newly 
graduated um, attorney. And so that really turned the thing about salaries on its head. And so the first people that we lost went to better opportunities. It was a lot more money. Some of them went to fully remote um, opportunities uh, in there. And then there's also what happens is about when a prosecutor gets to about four or five years in, they start looking for private jobs, right, in the private sector. And so we lost a couple people to private sectors. When we lost those individuals, it became very, um, very much more intense with the people who were left. Everybody was left with double the caseloads. I took on a caseload. My caseload is right now 870 cases, okay? It is unsustainable. When this started happening, I did go to the manager. I went to the mayor. I went to the commissions. This is back before September saying, hey, there is an issue happening here. We're not competitive. I'm losing people. We need to do something. They did nothing. Okay, and I have continued to come to them every single month. I have continued to have meetings. I have spoken up in mayor and commission meetings. They finally uh, agreed to do a market study, which is the first step. That market study is the first step to then go ahead and see if we can make these salaries competitive. But until we make them competitive, there's no way that we can really bring people in. So right now, the new people who are coming in, and some of them have 15 years of experience, they're coming in under state positions. And that's because state positions pay so much more than the county positions, right? So as a, as a comparison, one individual, 18 years experience, on the state level, they will be offered over $100,000. On the county level, they are offered 66. Okay? Now, what happens too is that when you are a state employee, an ADA, you are then can be offered what is called a county supplement. Now, not every county offers this. ACC does, but ACC's county supplement is only $500 per year with a max of $9,000, right? So when you're looking at places like Gwinnett that are giving 50% um, county salaries above the state salary, we're looking at a difference of anywhere between thirty dollars to $50,000 you know, for that same person. Can I add a comment to that? Because that seems to be the problem with the police department, that seems to be the problem with the fire department. So what in the world are we to do as citizens if the mayor's not listening to anybody? Where's the money going? Stop putting in LGBTQ sidewalks and crosswalks and start paying your tunnels. Let's 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 just stay with the questions, please. I know that some of these are really hot topics, but you guys took the time to write these questions, and so we're trying to get through as many as we can. Okay? So I'm gonna ask you. And the issue is that a lot of these are have to do with specific individuals. A lot of you are naming cases that involve specific individuals. And that we will are, not be talking about cases. And so that that can't be discussed. Um, Deborah, I have a question. A follow on. It was. It's a follow up on terms of the. Um, I'm sorry, uh, I'm, I'm going to have to say if you can just hold it because we do want to get to the right. So these are the these are the questions, questions that have to do with um, the uh, litigation or the legislation in the general assembly. So, what are your thoughts on the two pieces of legislation in the general assembly that propose establishing an oversight committee? To monitor, to monitor and possibly remove prosecuting attorneys from office. And there are three that have the same basic questions, um, but uh, HB 229 and HB 231 are aimed at DAs such as you uh, who have been, uh, who have been, uh, uh, who uh, failed to prosecute those uh, the citizens of Clark and Oconee want prosecuted to maintain a safer community. That's it. Okay. Sorry, the handwriting is not great. 
but they're essentially about HB229 and HB231. And I think I explained when we cannot prosecute, if we cannot prove the case beyond a reasonable doubt, then we cannot go forward with them. I know some people think that, you know, they see something in the newspaper and they say, that's what it is. You know, I know that this is what should happen. But there's so much that's happening behind the scenes things that we do not talk about because we're not permitted to talk about by our ethical conduct, and that's why I'm not going to be talking about specific cases tonight. As for the legislation, again, I didn't want to make this anything political. There are is legislation that is out there. The most concerning to me is legislation HB 231, not because of the oversight committee. What's concerning to me is the recall provision, that they are changing that recall provision from 30% to 2% only for DAs. Okay. Well, okay. And, you said an oversight committee, and not the DAs. I, I didn't say anything about the oversight committee. I'm talking about the recall because to me, to me, that change in that recall is about subverting the will of the people who elected their officials and what they wanted. And so to me, that is the biggest problem with that bill. Okay? 30% of the election and the election you are voted in, there are 30% of this. Excuse, excuse me, it is not different for any other elected official. If it is a concern, then it should be for all elected officials. Elected is a very targeted, very targeted issue. And they are really short-sighted because it means that anybody can recall any DA in any county at that 2%, not just the ones that they do not like the way that they are handling their office and their duties. It will go across every single one. So are you saying you would support a civilian oversight committee of, over the DA? Can you no, the I do not. The bill? HB 231, I do not support the oversight committee for the way that it is being right now comprised, which is partisan, which is appointment only by a governor, a, a um, Speaker of the House and the uh, Lieutenant Governor, the head of the Senate, all of whom are of one party and all of whom would have the ultimate appointment to that. That is not an independent oversight commission in that. There are many ways in which we can hold elected officials accountable, not just DAs, commissioners, mayors, state representatives, state um, senators, all different kinds of officials, and every single example that they have brought up in the legislature about a certain DA has been taken care of through the criminal system where they've been indicted or taken out of their role. So there is no need to have another mechanism that is partisan in the way it's been comprised and the way that it has been introduced so yes, I am against that. I have been vocal about it and I have put out public statements about each of those bills. But that should not be the focus of this because we're trying to get to your questions. So These are our questions. So according to your UA dashboard, which is supposed to be tied to your case management system, 2,105 cases were brought in, in your office. The DA dashboard shows 77% of the cases is pending. The DA dashboard shows your conviction rate at 8%. That is a 22% drop from your predecessor. Why? Are you proud of those results? Is this due to your lack of background in criminal law? Okay. Well, first of all, unfortunately, your DA dashboard is a little outdated. Um, when, we, we, when we were able to put that dashboard together, we were actually given a grant from Luminosity and they did all the IT. They spent over 5,500 hours putting that together. They did a lot of cleanup. One of the things that we discovered in that cleanup was that there was a lot of missing data that hadn't been put in years prior to me arriving. And that was because what we used to do the data dashboard was a case management system. 
And that's what it was meant to do, manage cases. It wasn't meant to collect data. So one of the things that we had to start doing in the office once we knew that we wanted to collect data was actually start defining what kind of data, how to enter it, um, common uh, field names, what does it mean, um, make sure that everybody was using it the way that they could. We got a small grant from Arnold Ventures that was able to hire a part-time data outcome coordinator. She's a graduate student from UGA um, to come in and start helping us look at this from a data standpoint, not just a case management standpoint, to help us start looking at if policies that we were putting in was making a difference, if decisions that we were making was making a difference or not. And so we are really at the very, very beginning of that process. And the data dashboard was the first step in just seeing what is there, what, what do the numbers have, but we've been discovering that there's still so many holes in that data that we need um, to go forward. I'm also not gonna comment on, on your numbers. I don't know where they come from exactly or how you made your calculations. We have other calculations. You know, one of the things that we were trying to do was to create sort of this report that we would be able to then give everybody. And um, we haven't been able to do that because of the understaffing. We weren't able to put that together in time, but it is still something that we're working on with that data person. And so we're really excited that we have her. Unfortunately, that grant is running out, right? Because there isn't a position in the county for this to be able to do this, right? So um, a dead body is a pretty good data. So this next question is, you're on the record as stating that you will not prosecute juveniles as adults unless required by law. Is that still your belief? Uh, you've lost three external <coughs> affairs directors since you took office. Uh, yeah, okay. So, yeah, this is the first one. Okay. Yeah, one of the things that we look at is this idea of treating children as children, right? And there are certain bylaw, there are certain charges, once they're 13, if they're charged with what we call the seven deadlies, then original jurisdiction goes to the superior court. It doesn't go to juvenile, right? It goes to superior court, they are charged as adults, that's what the law is, that is what has happened, okay? We have not um, brought down uh, cases, juvenile cases of that seriousness down back to juvenile. Part of that is because we communicate with our victims and see what it is that they also need so that they can have their healing and there are some cases that do not do that. Now there is legislation, um, it comes out every year about raising the age of minority from, from under 17 to under 18. Uh, and so I, I'm not sure if it got through crossover. Do you know if it went through crossover? I, I don't know if that one passed through crossover, but it's it's called the raise the age bill, and it's always about that, and that's part of the thing about um, that. But by Georgia law, if you're 13 and older and commit one of these very serious crimes, it does not go to juvenile. It goes directly to Superior Court. I have asked through the Open Records Act for information and date and data regarding 2022 arrests, indictments, prosecutions, and the decisions for those prosecutions. How long would you suspect that it would take before I received those records? Well, I, I don't know all of the numbers of the records. I can tell you that we've been having a series of open records requests. One of them has resulted in a request um, just tentatively of over 54,000 emails understand that with an open records request, what happens is one thing is to do the search to find the records, and then somebody has to physically review every single record to make sure that there's no information that needs to be redacted, like if somebody's personal cell number, or social security information, or if it's a work product, something in cases. Um, so you can imagine how much time it's going to take us to go through 54,000 records, and that's just one. Okay, I have six more just like that. And when you're looking at trying to be responsive to those open records requests and doing the work of this office um, in the courtroom and managing the department and dealing with uh, two different governments, eight different law enforcement agencies and the legislature on the other side, 
there's not a lot of time for everything. There's only 24 hours in a day. And at this point, you know, there are times that I wish even if it was 28 hours, I'd still be short six, okay? But there's only so much we can do and, and what the law requires us to do is give an estimate of the number of records, okay, that we have and then we work on it every single day to answer them. So if you want um, you know, your records really quick, stop sending more because it's just gonna get to the back of the line as we keep going through them, as we go through them in order. Some things are really easy, they want one document, we can do that really quick. But when you're asking for every single email that I have sent from January 1st, 2021 to the present, it's gonna take me years to get through that. Do you have an example of a situation in which you and the chief agree it's best not to prosecute? Yes, if there's not enough evidence to prove beyond a reasonable doubt, we will not go forward. Okay, with 2,400 cases that you walked into, was it more difficult for you since you have little trial experience? No, because never I, tried a case. When I came in, I had been very clear that I did not come through prosecution. And I had been very clear that the job that I saw was administrative, was about leading a team with a vision for justice for our community. Yes. Because for the past 48 years, that other side wasn't working. Okay? And so I felt that I would go into that way. Now, we have people, there's other positions, other attorneys that would be in the courtroom doing that work, right? But when you get under staff, what happens? You're the leader, you pick up the load. And that's why I am in the courtroom three to four days every week doing whatever needs to be done to get these cases prosecuted through the system, whether they go into accountability court, pre-child diversion, or whatever. I may have walked in with no prosecution experience, let me tell you, I have plenty now. <laughs> uh, we have a question about scholarships. I yeah. want to know more about scholarships. I don't have scholarships. <laughs> I wish I did. You know, it's something that, that we would love to do um, is offer scholarships. But right now, we have internships. Oh, but. I thought you said something about. Oh. Ah, uh, no, it, internship. Oh, internship. I thought yeah. you said something about earlier about you wish there were scholarships to offer Oh, I know what it was, the training. The training, yeah. the training. because there are organizations like with our victim advocates, right? There's a National Association of Victim Advocates and sometimes they have training and they offer scholarships. So what I tell my victim advocates and what I tell my ADA is if they find a training out there that has a scholarship, apply for the scholarship and if you get it, we'll help you get the money to get there, right? But at least because we just don't have thousands and thousands of dollars to put into training, but it's so important, right? It's one of the reasons why I want a gang prosecutor. You know why? Because they'll know the difference between what's a real gang case and what isn't. Because under the law in Georgia, a real gang case says that we have to have a nexus to the gang, uh -huh. that it's been done in furtherance of the gang. And a real gang prosecutor understands when it doesn't meet that standard and should not be prosecuted as a gang case, right? That's why you need that. I'm sorry, you really need to. Oh, nexus means that whatever happened was done in furtherance of the gang. That's what nexus means, right? So an individual who goes in maybe a gang member and steals six, six packs of beer and goes home and drinks it, that really wasn't for the gang. However, if he goes into a store and takes like four packs of beer and sells it and then goes gets marijuana and sells that in order to get that money, now you're seeing that there's a connection to the gang, right? And so for gang cases, we have to prove that by Georgia law, you have to prove that nexus or it's not a gang. How would you characterize your working relationship with the Oconee County Sheriff, James Hale, and his staff? Well, um, I would categorize it as cordial and more important than our relationship, which is very respectful. We do meet on occasion about specific cases. 
it's more important about his people, his deputy sheriff, his sheriff deputies, sorry about that, his sheriff deputies and my ABAs and my investigators who are working together. So for example, my investigator in Oconee goes to a weekly meeting with the sheriff deputies and, and you know, what are the cases that are coming up? What's the, the things that we need to share in terms of the evidence? If there's something that's missing, we are there every single week. So we are part of that conversation. That didn't happen before. That happens now. Has the market study on ADA salaries begun and will they examine exit interviews from your former employees? Um, I don't know if it's begun yet. I know that the, um, the last thing that I heard, the ACC government has a particular company that they work with to do this and they have done the public safety <laughs> study before um, and I don't know what it would entail, right? I'm not into those details. Okay, you have many objectives towards professional development and social justice. What are you doing to ensure victim justice? Yeah, that's great because for us, you know, believe it or not, every program that we do really does dealt with victims. We put in a, a special, we worked with the um, School of Social Work to develop a trauma-informed victim lounge that we're very proud of and we got a small grant to be able to do that. <laughs> Our victim advocates are always out there doing their training so that they can be better. M more victim advocates that we have now have a social work background than ever before. That was not something that the office had before. We have social work interns. That again was not something that was ever in that office before. It is there now to work with victims. Okay, there are a couple of questions that um, really are the same thing, so I'm just gonna read them uh, both. Has your office explored restorative justice efforts in prosecution of cases? What does that look like? Can you give us examples? And then the other one says, can you tell us about diversion programs and restorative justice? Yeah, so basically the same. So we just started our program in January of this year. It took over a, a year to be able to get the MOU signed by all the partners, and that includes you know, the juvenile courts, the judges there, it includes um, the Georgia Conflict Center, it includes my office um, and DJJ, Department of uh, uh, Juvenile Justice. And we met for over a year, sort of coming together, developing uh, this program. We finally got the MOU signed late <coughs> last year. And so we started opening it up. But remember that I said that this is voluntary. Both sides have to want to come. So it takes, it's a process, right, first, a case is identified by my juvenile prosecutor. Uh, she speaks with the victim, see if the victim is open, then if the defendant has an attorney, then we talk to the defendant and see if they're interested in that. Um, and then we hand it over to the Georgia Conflict Center. They have um, trained facilitators. They go through a process of where they have these restorative justice conferences out of those conferences comes out a restorative justice plan that the person who um, offended then sides off and says that this is what they're going to do. The victim is very much part of that process in order to get to that plan. So it's an agreement that the individual makes with the victim and with the community to be able to, one, be held accountable for what they did, and two, to be restorative in how they then um, bring up that accountability. So, so we, we haven't had one yet. We've evaluated now three of them, and I think there are two more in the pipeline. And that was my question, Deborah, but my question is more so, have, have your office done um, restorative justice for not just juveniles, but for adults? No, we're just starting with juveniles first. Okay. And then what we hope to do is move from juveniles who are under 17 to the emerging adult, right? which is between 17 and 24 based on the science, and then after that, then the adult population. But first we wanted to make sure that we can actually get it off the ground and that there would be interest. Um, we're also in the process of seeking grants to be able to pay for this program. Okay, thank you. You're welcome. Are you familiar with Kim Fox, the district attorney in Chicago, and her policies? They are similar to your policies. Um, yes, I met Kim Fox. Kim and I are both members of Fair and Just Prosecution. It's a national organization. There's about 70 of us 
prosecutors from around the country. We get together, we share um, different models, things that work, things that didn't work. Um, what can you try, what can you not try? It's sort of a support group. It's kind of lonely when you're the only DA, right? In the county and who you talk to. Um, but it's just a networking group that allows us to share what it is um, that we're doing, what worked, what didn't work, you know, places that you might be able to find resources, places that, you know, um, recruitment and things of that nature. So is it working for her? Are you, is she able to share things that are working for her? Yes, we, we, we try. It doesn't we seem like things are working. Nothing is working. Well, <laughs> I don't think, you know, let's be careful about saying like nothing works or everything works. These sort of absolutes are not really the truth of the matter, right? Well, the Some things let's, say, let's look at both of things are not going well. In, in my experience, to be very honest, what you see is more the negative out there in the media than what is carried to be positive and what works. Because what works That's isn't true. isn't, you know, exciting to read, right? What we, want to read, what we want to read is what's not working. You know, what, what is it that makes somebody look bad or what is it that was a mistake? That is what usually gets to the news than what we see as, as the um, positive. Okay. You stated that you have to prioritize prosecutions due to lack of personnel. How many necessary prosecutions are not occurring because of this? None. I have been, up to now, I have been able to put an attorney, a barred attorney, in front of every judge who has needed a judge in front of them every single day. There is a speedy trial release. The, the guy was released because he didn't get a speedy trial. Because he didn't that was not what the question referred to. It's the same thing. Yeah, that's the question. <laughs> you mentioned the many local organizations. You mentioned the many local organizations that you have. You, you mentioned the many local organizations that you have partnered with. How many prosecutors do you have in the office, and can you speak to why you're so short-staffed? I think we answered that. Yes. Yeah. I mean, there's a, a whole stack of questions that refer to specific individuals that are uh, that we just can't. No, you can't, can't you can't ask. Uh, How about the work of a mother who lost her son on a hit and run accident and her experience same. with your office? Would you like to hear her work? Yes, yes, yes. yes. Let's listen. We are still going through the questions. We have set up this process and everyone has been following it and we want to follow it as well. We were not given what the process would be. It was um, billed as a listening session. The library said it was a listening session. Did you, did your campaign receive donations from any George Soros supported organization? No. You mentioned priority juvenile justice and having a Prosecutor assigned just to juvenile court. You recently hired a couple of special prosecutors. Can you explain exactly what they were doing and how much they were getting paid? So special prosecutors are brought in not just in my office, but in all different offices. So we have, number one, an organization called the Prosecuting Attorneys Council. Um, and they have a, a series of prosecutors. And so they go around the state and when DA offices are short or they have you know, a case that they need a little help on, they will put some special prosecutors on it. Um, and so we don't pay for those. We don't pay for the PAC prosecutors when they come in. So right now the PAC prosecutors are doing the appeals in our office. There are not many appeals. We don't get many appeals in the office, but it is sort of very time consuming to do appeals and it's all about writing briefs. And so they have a person who is specialized in appeals, and so they are doing the appeals for us, but we do not pay for um, the past special prosecutors. So those okay. prosecutors, they're not meant to be in the courtroom, they're meant to no, be No, they're not, okay. most of them are not meant to be in the courtroom. Um, and then we have uh, a special prosecutor who will take on a trial, right? And so that's different from these prosecutors. Um, and again, because they are shared between the DA offices, we don't pay for them. 
right? But they're only there for like one particular case. It's not that they're there to pick up a whole load, right? It's for a particular, so for example, if I don't have somebody with expertise on a vehicular homicide, I can get a prosecutor who that's what they need, right? We, we need to not have someone create crime on As DA, how many cases have you tried? Um, I have tried in trial two cases, but remember, most of the cases get what? They get plea negotiated. You don't go to trial. And I have a defense attorney right here who can, you know, confirm that that's exactly what happens, right? So I, I can tell you, you know, next week we're gonna have another trial. We had a trial calendar of 40 cases 39 of them resolved, and the one that didn't resolve, we're going to trial next week on. So it's not that it's unusual or that I'm not st I'm trying to stay away from trials, it's just that's the nature of what we do and the work that we do. Do you think Athens is charges, but at least, yes, they, I, just to confirm, somebody asked for right of charges, but at least one felony crime to DA, yes. If they're all misdemeanors, they go down to the Solicitor General. If there's one felony, then it comes up to us at the DA and we then prosecute the misdemeanors and the felonies together. So it goes to where the highest charge is. That's where it will go. So it says here, I admire the objectives that you have enumerated, but it seems to me that your job is to prosecute wrongdoing. Am I wrong? No, you're not, but what I want you to think about for a moment is how you define prosecution, because I think this is where, you know, TVs and movies always say prosecution is being in the courtroom, bang, 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 you know, this is the truth and all of that, but everything we do in this office is prosecution. It's about processing these cases and holding people accountable. It's just we have so many more tools than we've ever had before in how we hold people accountable. We have accountability courts, we have pretrial diversion, we have restorative justice, we have all of these different ways, and so much happens outside of the courtroom. And so, you know, I was a state representative, and the way that I equated is this. If you ever go to the Capitol, and I hope all of you have the opportunity to actually go and sit in the chamber and watch what is happening, most people will say, well, wait a minute, they're not sitting in their chairs, they're not listening, they're out there, they're talking to people. Why aren't they at their chairs listening? Because the work is done by talking to your colleagues, right? The work is done behind the scenes before that vote gets made. The work for these cases gets done before we get to the courtroom, and that's what people don't really see or understand. It's like an iceberg, right? Just 5% is up there, just 5% happens in the court. But the rest of it is happening behind the scenes as we're talking and working these things out and looking for the best resolution for the victim, the defendant, and the community. And sometimes, you know, unlike the defense, that that's their client, right? The defendant is their client. The victim is not our client. Our client is the community. And sometimes, you know, that victim will come up and say, I don't like your plea deal. I don't like this. I want him to go to jail. I want the death penalty. I want this. And our job is to find the balance. You're a prosecutor, not a social worker. Sometimes yeah. you need to it does not. Sometimes it is not the right reason or the right crime to put somebody to death or life without parole. You I, and you cannot do that. Not that. Yes. Okay. Why so many repeat offenders on streets? Because we're not addressing the core issues. If all we're trying to do is put them in jail over and over and over again, they're going to keep coming out and they're going to keep doing Ladies and gentlemen, please. She's not answering the questions. She's not answering Why the won't you resign instead of expending funds on an awful future? I will not resign because I 
I'm doing the job that the people elected me to do. They had to do with pending cases that are that are out there. Well, we want to thank all they of you cases. for being here. Are are they 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 Why did there they is, we did this? put up an email there. Please send any follow-up questions or anything that you want to VA community at accgov.com, and we will get to them where we can. Thank you so much for being here.